Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Yaza Maslah. I'm a second year PhD researcher from the University of Southampton. Today, I'll be touching on um, a very important topic over the next couple of decades, which is the deployment of solar energy and ever so slightly touch on the research I've been carrying out over the course of the last 12 months of my PhD. Next slide, please. So before I begin, um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm an, I'm an IET accredited electrical power engineer alumni from Newcastle University. Um, distinguished graduation with a first class mark in every module, a feat that earned me um, a ranking of second among my peers in electrical and electronic engineering. So during my studies, I dedicated time in gaining insight in the R&D of photovoltaics and automation design electronics in award-winning firms in the Middle East and in Europe. I presented and published at uh, national and international conferences alongside publishing my fieldwork, which I'll be talking about today in the IEEE Journal of Photovoltaics. So my PhD is titled um, Optimizing Bifacial Tracking Systems for High Latitude and Diffuse Climate Applications Through Outdoor Testing. It is a quite lengthy PhD title, and I hope that I can help you understand what my PhD is about during this presentation. Next slide, please. So, researchers and politicians have been working side by side with the alarming global changes in the climate. And I've come to the consensus that efforts must be made to keep the 1.5 degrees um, Celsius goal alive, which was declared in the infamous Paris Agreement. However, as per the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2022, each country has pledged to outline its contributions as such goals in danger, such as the carbon neutrality zones and countries going carbon neutral. So as seen from the figure on the right, 45% of carbon dioxide emissions must decline before 2030, and the renewable energy supply needs to increase by at least 70% by 2050. But how can we achieve such ambitious goals? Next slide, please. So why solar? Arguably, solar is responsible for all forms of energy. Coal, for instance, is derived from fossilized um, plant matter that have used photosynthesis, which is a form of solar energy from sunlight. On the other end of the spectrum, wind consists of water condensation of the atmosphere, which again is caused by the sun's heat. So the sun generates magnitudes of energy. And due to the inverse square law, the power per unit area falls as a square of the distance. So basically on the Earth's surface, the extraterrestrial radiation is equal to 1,361 watts per meter squared, give or take 0.1% due to how the sun cycle constantly changes. So <clears throat> as seen over here, in one hour, the Earth receives approximately 173,500 terawatt hours worth of energy. So the Earth's electricity consumption worldwide is approximately 25,000 terawatt hours. So if we utilize 14.4% of such abundant energy from the sun in one hour, it would be able to meet the energy demand of our globe for a whole year. So again, if we utilize just that fraction in one hour that is produced by the sun, we can meet the humanity's electrical demand for a whole year. So domestically speaking, for example, um, the UK's current 14 gigawatt solar capacity will be increased by five times by 2030, as stated by the United Kingdom's um, strategy for energy security. But how can um, such ambitious goal be met? Um, next slide, please. Before I move on, I, I, I don't want to dive deep into the semiconductor physics, as my research, research focus, focuses on the system level. So basically, a solar cell converts light from the sun into electrical energy through a process called the photovoltaic effect, hence the word photo, photovoltaics. So when photons from the sun hit the cell, they knock electrons loose from the atom in the material of the cell, mostly being silicon, creating a flow of electricity. So today's market is shifting away from the standard aluminum back surface field solar cell, which has been dominating in the early 20th century. Where, however, as you can see from, from the figure over here, it will become obsolete in 2024. 
all other solar cell technologies, ranging from PERC um, um, to silicon heterojunction, are on the rise, where all of them can be ad adapted to being bifacial. So what is bifacial? Um, next uh, slide, please. So monofacial modules, they're fixed to an angle, which has been the standard for many years. But in order to meet the trends discussed earlier, we must be open-minded to other configurations. Research advancements have been made in the bifacial cell technology, where panels will be able to harvest light not only from the front, but also from the back. The main difference between monofacial and bifacial panels is that the back sheet is replaced by either a transparent layer or a layer of, graph, uh, layer of glass. So advantages of these might include um, high efficiency, durability, the ability to harvest diffused light due to its great, great um, surface area. These all explain why bifacial modules are gaining market share and throwing the monofacial out of the throne. Next slide, please. However, there seems to be a lack of standardization um, for bifacial modules and systems. So research and industry are working hand in hand to work towards setting up standards for bifacial modules across different conditions and different scenarios. So in this slide, you can see that there has work, has yet to be work to be done on bifacial energy rating, for example, or standard, standardized testing conditions. So work needs to be done on that over the next couple of years. Next slide, please. So moving on to the soil characteristics and how the sun path varies. I wanted to quickly explain the coordinate system of the sun so that we're all on the same level. So basically the sun flows in a Cartesian coordinate system, the azimuth and um, the altitude. So basically in layman terms, the azimuth shows the direction of the sun due north from zero to 360 degrees, while the altitude indicates how high up the sun is. So the sun path mainly changes due to the day of the year or the location. Um, instead of location, let's think about it in terms of latitude. You can see two different latitudes, 51 degrees, for example, in London, and zero degrees, which of course translates to the equator. In the equator, you can see where um, that the sun path is set to be a perfect hemisphere. That is orthogonal in the winter, summer, and spring solstice or equinox. In London, however, the sun path changes drastically. Um, let me visualize it for you. Next slide, please. So let's take Singapore as an example. It has a latitude of one degrees approximately. So they're very close to the, to the equator. You can see that during the different solstice, for example, in the winter or in the sun, the altitude in the, of the sun and its azimuth is somewhat consistent throughout the year, showing a near identical sun path. Next slide, please. On the other hand, in London, you can see quite the opposite. In the summer, the altitude of the sun is stretched and inclined at an angle, exposing more sun hours in the early mornings and in the late afternoons. However, during, the, uh, during December or the winter solstice, the altitude range is set to be decreased, showing a narrower sun path and hence fewer sunlight hours. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> there was this research article that was written called the International Technology Roadmap for Photovoltaics, or ITRPV for short. In 2022, they reported that by 2030, tracking technologies will be integrated and used in 40% of PV systems. So there are many tracking technologies that use different algorithms and different mechanical structures and different costs, of course. A fixed tilt system, which is the most popular, is as the name depicts, um, it's visually anchored at an angle relative to the latitude of the area, i.e. the average latitude of, um, of the altitude of the sun. Single axis tracking corresponds to tracking the sun in one degree of movement or one degree of, move, uh, of freedom, either in terms of its altitude or in terms of its azimuth. Dual axis tracking, as the name depicts, has the free movement in both Cartesian coordinates. However, of course, in research, trade-offs are essential and levelized cost of electricity is a main priority. Sure, dual axis tracking um, gives you the highest energy yield, but of course that comes at a high upfront cost. Next slide, please. So within the first couple of months of my PhD, I carried out experimental work to analyze dual axis tracking in the UK, 
for varying sky clearness index with the help of my industrial partner as part of my PhD. So within Oxfordshire, parameters were essentially measuring the broad body radiance of the sun, were situated in plane uh, of dual axis uh, tracker, uh, resembled by POA DAT, and also on the opposite side, BOA DAT, measuring the reflected irradiance. And of course, uh, we measured the albedo, which again, in layman terms, is um, the reflectivity of the site or the re reflectivity of the ground in the site. And uh, that was measured using an albedo meter, which compromises of two top of the range spectrally flat class A parameters. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so how did I calculate the clearness index? Um, it, it was calculated using GHI, which is placing your parameter horizontally at an elevated height, being 1.5 to 2 meters, as suggested by some specifications in the IET. And uh, it was basically a ratio of GHI to the extraterrestrial um, irradiance that uh, can be compromised, can be, can be taken from, from algorithms. Now, such um, range or limits are arbitrary. So from literature, it says in the UK, when you have a sky clearness index less than 0 0.3, it's categorized as overcast. And if it has 0 0.78 or above, it's clear. And of course, in between is, um, is intermediate. Now, from the figure on the right, you can see that the plane of array of a dual axis tracker is evaluated in comparison to the horizontal irradiance measurement. So you can see that it has a approximate, approximately 53% of irradiance is accumulated under clear conditions when using a dual axis tracker. However, for overcast conditions, if you situate your dual axis trackers, uh, you situate your dual axis tracker horizontally, you'll be able to collect around 60% more irradiance. So that again is in line with literature findings. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Now, if we compare the power generated by the same dual axis tracker and um, a fixed tilt installation that is optimally placed for the whole year, being south facing and having a latitude of 50, uh, an altitude of 51 degrees. So it can be seen that regardless of how clear the sky is, the dual axis tracker will always outperform its fixed tilt counterpart. Power gains, however, of course, are, are heavily dependent on the sky cleanness index. So in clear condition, the dual axis tracker outperforms the fixed tilt um, installation by 34%, and in overcast conditions by um, 15%, and in intermediate conditions, 22%. So dual access tracking throughout the whole year is, 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 um, is a good option. Now, to perform a bifacial tracking evaluation, again, this should be really simple to understand. I've assumed a bifacility factor of one, which is basically mimicking that the rear side is exactly like the front side and uh, measured albedo of 0 0.17 of grass. There is a 17% uplift um, compared to the monofacial counterpart. So this basically demonstrates the potential of dual axis trackers with bifacial modules. Potential loop control methods using perhaps machine learning may incorporate this data and further studies of bifacial dual axis trackers at different latitudes across uh, altitudes across um, across the world world um, next slide please another area that was explored is modeling and its potential to be validated using outdoor data collection bifacial radiance was used um, which is a python heavy software developed by nrel in the us it uses open source libraries to generate uh, um, geometry in, in in relation to the sky models it also allows for high PC integration and uses reverse ray tracing technology or techniques rather um, to, to model radiance at different sensors that are placed at fixed tilt or single axis tracking. So next slide, please. So using GIS mapping and bifacial radiance of 15 different locations that are all within the same time frame. Locations ranged from um, Aberdeen to Belfast um, to Cardiff or, or even Southampton. A map of monofacial fixed tilt corresponding to the location's latitude was created and interpolated. You can see that HSAT, which is horizontal single axis tracking in the east-west direction, 
and horizontal single axis tracking in the north-south direction were plotted. It can be seen that uh, HSAT NS has uh, an uplift of 17% relative to the fixed tilt counterpart, or 5% relative to its fixed tilt counterpart. Next slide, please. When bifacial is, um, is added to the mix, it can be seen that the uplifts ranged from um, 32% to up to 49%. So uh, one must ask, what about dual axis tracking? Bifacial dual axis tracking. Work needs to be done on that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so, so modeling that are computer intensive are not applicable in the industry. We may have some solar engineers uh, in, in the Zoom meeting right now, and they're pretty familiar with PVSYS, which is basically a mathematical view factor software that uses a concept called transposition modeling. Uh, and, and it uses couple, uh, it's coupled with um, satellite imagery of horizontal radiance approximations to give your model the plane of array. There are many different uh, decomposition models or, or transposition models, but they're all empirical and uh, they're case specific to a certain location under a certain scenario. So um, hopefully this slide summarizes what I'm saying. 